we settled on the title of, uh, of this talk, uh, few people uh, could have realized how apt it would be uh, when the time uh, came. That is, how dramatically the world would be changing, uh, how far-reaching are the uh, implications for domestic and uh, world order. I'm referring, of course, to the democ democracy uprising in the Arab world. It's been quite a spectacular display of courage, uh, dedication, and commitment by popular forces. And it happened to coincide uh, fortuitously uh, with a remarkable uprising of tens of thousands of people in support of uh, working people and democracy in uh, Madison, Wisconsin and a number of other U.S. cities still continuing. Uh, one very telling event uh, took place on February 20th in the middle of both of these uprisings. Uh, Kamal Abbas is uh, one of uh, a labor leader, one of the major labor leaders in Egypt, uh, sent a message uh, from Tahrir Square to uh, Wisconsin uh, in the name of the Egyptian uh, labor organizations, uh, it said uh, simply, we stand with you as you stood with us. Well, as I said, Abbas is a leader of the uh, many years of struggle f in Egypt for elementary rights. This uprising on January 25th didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, there's a significant background. Actually, the background is worth uh, thinking about. As I'm sure you know, the January 25th uprising was uh, initiated by a small group of uh, um, tech-savvy young people who uh, called themselves the April 6th movement. Uh, the reason for the name is that in April 6th, 2008, there was a major uh, labor action prepared at the, uh, one of the biggest uh, industrial sites in Egypt, the Mahala textile plant. It was to be a, a strike for uh, better wages, decent working conditions, and so on. And it was to be in connection with a large uh, a solidarity actions. Now, all of that was crushed right away by the dictatorship. Uh, and didn't have any uh, resonance in the West, but remember in Egypt. So that's the April 6th. Uh, uh, demonstration, non-demonstration, uh, the name of the movement that started the uh, January 25th uprising uh, with its remarkable consequences. Uh, Abbas's uh, measure of solidarity uh, evoked the traditional aspir aspiration of the labor movement uh, throughout the world, uh, solidarity among the workers of the world and in general among populations of the world. Well, however flawed their records may be, uh, labor movements have regularly been in the forefront of popular struggles for uh, basic rights and for democracy. In uh, Tahrir Square in Cairo, in the streets of Madison, and many other places, the popular struggles that are underway now uh, reach quite directly to the prospects for authentic democracy, that is, for socio-political socio systems in which uh, people are free and equal participants in controlling the institutions uh, in which they live and work. That's contrary to uh, standard democratic theory uh, which holds that people should be spectators, not participants, uh, leave the important things to others. Uh, right now the trajectories in Cairo and Madison are intersecting, but they're headed in opposite directions. In Cairo, they're heading towards gaining elementary rights that were denied by the uh, US-backed, British-backed dictatorships. Uh, in uh, Madison, they're directed towards defending rights that have been, had been won in long and hard struggles now under severe attack, and in fact the fundamental right of collective bargaining has just been eliminated by the uh, uh, governor and the legislature in Madison. Uh, 
there are sure to be uh, far-reaching consequences of what is taking place in the decaying industrial heartland of the richest and most powerful country in the world, in fact, in human history, and uh, what is taking place in what uh, President Eisenhower many years ago called the most strategically important area in the world, uh, a stupendous source of strategic power, probably the richest economic prize in the world in the field of foreign investment. Uh, those are the assessments of the State Department, U.S. State Department in the 1940s, and of course that was a prize that the U.S. intended to keep for itself and for its allies in the unfolding uh, world order of that day. Well, despite all the changes since, there's every reason to suppose that today's policymakers uh, are still guided by a judgment that was uh, articulated by one of President Roosevelt's uh, leading advisors, uh, A. Burley, who observed that control of the incomparable energy reserves of the Middle East would yield substantial control of the world. And correspondingly, uh, that loss of control would uh, threaten the project of global dominance that was clearly articulated during World War II that has been sustained in the face of major changes in world order since that day and that is very much alive today. Uh, you can be confident that in the major planning centers of uh, the United States, uh, Britain, France, other uh, countries with some uh, intent on global reach, uh, they're very much concerned that the loss of control of the energy reserves of the Middle East will uh, undermine the prospects for control of the world uh, and are acting accordingly. You'll have noticed, I'm sure, that uh, the closer demonstrations come to the uh, U.S.-British dominated uh, oil producing centers, uh, the harder, the, the lower the prospects for demonstrations. Uh, yesterday in uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, the major centers, the demonstrations were crushed before they started. Uh, you give some lessons to China. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh, uh, not a single person showed up, too frightened, and no, no comment from the West. I checked the uh, U.S. newspapers this morning, uh, no comment. If it had happened in Iran, there'd be major headlines, you can be sure. Uh, but too much is at stake when you get to the real centers of uh, uh, power. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, President Obama has uh, changed the rhetoric, the official rhetoric, with regard to the democracy uprisings as they come close to significant areas. Uh, actually, he and other <coughs> Western leaders uh, did, not, did not support the uprisings. In fact, the only political leader to support the uprisings uh, strongly and immediately was uh, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan of, uh, of Turkey, who is by far the most respected leader in the area. The others uh, waited, uh, uh, and when it was clear that you couldn't preserve your favorite dictators anymore, they was, followed the usual game plan and sent them out to pasture and try to maintain the regime. Uh, and they did use words like regime change at the end. But as it gets to Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, the terminology changed officially to regime alteration. So maybe some slight modification, but no change in the regime. As I say, in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, uh, nothing. Can't too much of a police presence. Bahrain is particularly significant uh, for two reasons. Uh, one reason, it hosts the U.S. Fifth Fleet, the major military force in the region. The other, which is even more significant, is that uh, Bahrain has a, it's a Sunni dictatorship, but it has a, a majority Shia, Shiite population, and it's right across the causeway from Saudi Arabia, uh, eastern Saudi Arabia, which is largely Shiite, and where most of the oil is. Uh, there's a kind of an accident of history and uh, geography, which has placed the bulk of the world's energy reserves uh, 
at the northern end of the Persian Gulf, that region right there, which is overwhelmingly Shiite. And there's been a deep concern in uh, planning sectors for a long time that there might end up being some kind of a Shiite alliance uh, independent of the West, uh, which would control most of the world's oil. And that's why uh, demonstrations in Bahrain are regarded as so sensitive. No calls for regime change there, and certainly not Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. Uh, well, from the outset of uh, the Second World War in uh, 1939, uh, Washington anticipated that the war would end uh, with the United States in a position of overwhelming power. Uh, High-level uh, State Department officials, uh, foreign policy specialists, uh, met in uh, a group called the War Peace Studies Group uh, right through the wartime years to lay out plans for the post-war world. Uh, the core notion was what they called a grand area that the U.S. was to dominate in the post-war world. That included, at a minimum, the entire Western Hemisphere, the entire Far East, and the former British Empire, which the U.S. was going to take over. Uh, that includes its uh, uh, Middle East uh, energy res resources. The British, I should say, were not entirely uh, happy about this. There was actually a kind of a mini-war going on during the Second World War between the United States and Britain over who would control Saudi Arabia, the kind of jewel in the crown. Uh, the, of course, the U.S. won the conflict. Uh, President Roosevelt uh, declared Saudi Arabia vital for the defense of democracy and freedom. Uh, that allowed it to get lend-lease aid to sort of push the British aside and make sure the right people took it over. The British Foreign Office recognized ruefully that uh, from now on the best they can hope for is to be junior partners of, uh, that's their phrase, of the master. And so it's remained since. That's called a special relationship, uh, technically. Well, that was the plan for the post-war world in the early years. It was assumed then that Germany would remain as a dominant European power. But as uh, Russia began to grind down the uh, Nazi armies after Stalingrad, a grand area planning uh, changed. The goals extended. Uh, to as much to include as much of Eurasia as possible, at the very least its uh, economic core in Western Europe. Uh, within the grand area, I'm now quoting, uh, the U.S. was to maintain unquestioned power with military and economic supremacy uh, while ensuring the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with its global designs. The words are worth remembering. They still apply. Uh, the, these careful wartime plans were uh, very soon implemented. It was always recognized from, from the very beginning that Europe might choose to follow an independent course. It's capable of doing that. Uh, NATO was established uh, in part, partially intended to uh, counter that threat. Uh, it's interesting to see what happened as soon as the official pretext for NATO ended in 1989. Uh, anyone who believed 50 years of propaganda uh, would have concluded, okay, NATO will disappear. It was there to save Western Europe from the Russian hordes. Okay, no more Russian hordes, no more NATO. Uh, not exactly what happened. Rather, NATO was expanded immediately. It was expanded to the east uh, in violation from verbal pledges to Gorbachev, which he was naive enough to believe. Uh, since then, it's been extended even further. It's become a uh, U.S.-run global intervention force, a very far-reaching scope. Uh, the, the scope actually was spelled out by NATO Secretary General, uh, Yap de Hope Schaeffer, who informed the NATO conference that, I'm quoting him, NATO troops have to guard pop pipelines that transport oil and gas that is directed for the West, and more generally, NATO must protect sea routes used by tankers and other crucial infrastructure of the energy system. That's everything, in other words. 
So that's NATO's job, grand area has expanded, at least in intention. Uh, grand area doctrines uh, clearly license uh, military intervention at will, and that conclusion has been repeatedly expressed. It was probably articulated most clearly by the Clinton administration, uh, which declared, I'm quoting it, that the U.S. has the right to use military force unilaterally to ensure uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources, and must maintain huge military forces uh, forward deployed in Europe and Asia in order to shape people's opinions about us and to shape events that will affect our livelihood and our security. And notice that goes well beyond the notorious Bush doctrine uh, for Clinton, it wasn't even necessary to concoct pretexts for military intervention. It's enough just to say our, our security and power depends on it. Uh, Clinton's uh, pronouncements went, didn't, did not arouse much comment. Bush's uh, led to a huge protest. Now, the reason didn't have to do with content, it had to do with style. As I said, Clinton's act position actually went further. Uh, but the Bush presentations were uh, arrogant and dismissive. Uh, European leaders don't like to be told to their face as they were, either you do what we say or you're irrelevant. Uh, they're perfectly happy to accept that conclusion, but it has to be said politely. And Clinton said it politely so everyone was happy. And so this is one of the reasons for Obama's popularity. Uh, the, uh, the same principles uh, governed the invasion of Iraq uh, as uh, the U.S. failure to impose its uh, will in Iraq it was becoming unmistakable, uh, the initial goals of the invasion, the actual goals, uh, could no longer be concealed behind pretty rhetoric. Uh, so the government began to express them. In November 2007, uh, the White House issued uh, what it called a Declaration of Principles concerning Iraq, it had two points. It demanded that uh, U.S. forces must remain indefinitely in Iraq with the right to carry out military operations. And secondly, uh, Iraq must privilege American investors. Uh, two months later, President Bush uh, sharpened that. He informed Congress that he would reject any legislation that might limit the per permanent stationing of U.S. armed forces in Iraq or, and I'm quoting it, or that would interfere with United States control over the oil resources of Iraq. Uh, those are the war aims. Forget the business about democracy promotion. Uh, the, uh, these were demands, incidentally, that the U.S. had to abandon uh, shortly after in the face of Iraqi resistance. It's a, quite an interesting story in itself. Uh, in Tunisia and Egypt, the first major centers of the uprising uh, and the ones where it's so far been most successful. The current uh, popular uprising has indeed won impressive victories, uh, but uh, they're limited. Uh, the Carnegie Endowment a few days ago, uh, two of its specialists reported that uh, while names have changed, the regimes remain. And they pointed out that a change in ruling elites and system of governance is still a diff distant goal in both countries. Uh, the report goes on to discuss internal barriers uh, to democracy. For example, the role of the Egyptian military in dominating a large part of the economy. But it doesn't touch the ex external barriers, uh, which as always are quite significant. Uh, the United States and its uh, Western allies are sure to do whatever they can to prevent authentic democracy in the Arab world. Uh, to understand why, it's only necessary to look at the studies of Arab uh, public opinion that are conducted by leading U.S. polling agencies uh, released by prestigious institutions, the most recent by the Brookings Institute in Washington. Well, these are barely reported. In fact, in the U.S., zero, no report. In England, I've been able to find one report by Jonathan Steele, uh, 
very good commentator. Uh, uh, but they're not, they're not reported, but they're certainly known to planners. You can be certain of that. And uh, what they reveal is that by overwhelming majorities, uh, Arabs regard the United States and Israel as the major threats they face. Uh, in Egypt, 90% uh, of the population regard the United States as the major threat. Uh, the figures for the general region are scarcely less. Uh, there are some who regard Iran as a threat, at 10%. Uh, opposition to U.S. policy is so strong that a majority believe that security would be improved if Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, in Egypt, that's about 80%. Uh, other figures are similar. So if public opinion were to influence policy, as would happen in anything that deserves the name of a democracy, the U.S. not only would not control the region, but it would be expelled from it, written as well. Uh, that would undermine fundamental principles of uh, global dominance that, in the case of Britain, go back more a century, more than a century, in the case of the United States, back to the Second World War. And that's not going to happen easily. Uh, so uh, talk about democracy, uh, and that's for ideologists and propagandists. In the real world, the uh, elite dislike for democracy is uh, very strong, and it's the norm that's it's been reluctantly conceded by the better scholarship that, uh, not just in this case, but globally, that the United States supports democracy insofar as it conforms to strategic and economic objectives. In that case, you can say democracy is fine, but not when it conflicts with it. And in this case, there's a massive conflict. Actually, the general elite contempt for democracy, not just planners, but the whole educated culture, uh, that was revealed very dramatically in the reaction to the WikiLeaks exposures. Uh, the ones that received the most attention, um, big headlines and so on, euphoric commentary, uh, were the cables reporting uh, Arab support for the U.S. stand on Iran. The reference, of course, was to the ruling dictators. The attitudes of the public were unmentioned because they're insignificant in the our intellectual culture. Uh, the, there's a guiding principle that was uh, stated pretty clearly by a Carnegie Endowment Middle East specialist uh, Marwan Muasher, who's formerly a high official of the Jordanian dictatorship. Uh, the principle is, there is nothing wrong, everything's under control. In short, if the dictators support us, what else could matter? Uh, if the dictators support us, populations passive, quiet, beaten down, uh, not making any noise, everything's fine. That's our conception of democracy, actually domestically as well, I should say. Uh, this. Uh, Muashar doctrine is uh, it's rational and it's venerable. Uh, let me just mention one case that's highly relevant today uh, and ought to be kind of headlines if the free press were functioning. Uh, this is 1958, uh, internal discussion in the United States since declassified. Uh, President Eisenhower expressed concern about what he called the campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world, and not by governments, they're okay, but by the people. Uh, the highest planning body in the U.S., the National Security Council, uh, issued a memorandum in which they explained what it's all about. They explained that there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports dictatorships and uh, uh, blocks democracy and development and that we do that so as to ensure control over their uh, energy resources. Uh, furthermore, the NSC went on, the perception's accurate, and uh, furthermore, it's what we should be doing, uh, relying on the Washer Doctrine. As long as the people are subdued and quiet, repressed, the dictators support us, everything's fine. Uh, that's 1958. Uh, there were Pentagon studies conducted after 9-11 uh, reached very much the same conclusion, and the same holds today. And furthermore, that's the understanding in the educated culture in the West. As you can see, for example, from the reaction to the uh, 
uh, WikiLeaks doctrines, uh, uh, revelations, and even from the lack of reporting of Arab public opinion. I don't know about the Dutch press, you can tell me, but in the press that I've looked at, it's not even mentioned because who cares what Arabs think as long as the dictators support us. Uh, of course, if they raise their heads, we have to do some things, but not much. Uh, well, it's quite normal for uh, victors uh, to consign uh, history to the trash can, uh, uh, old-fashioned old stuff of no interest. Uh, but the victims tend to take it pretty seriously uh, for obvious reasons. So let me make a couple of uh, few remarks on this topic. It's quite an important topic. But a couple of comments may be useful in this connection. Actually, today is not the first time that Egypt and uh, the United States are facing similar problems and moving in opposite directions. Now, that was also true in the early 19th century. Uh, economic historians have pointed out that in, say, around 1830, uh, Egypt was quite well placed to uh, undertake rapid economic development about the same time the U.S. was. They were more or less in the same situation. Uh, both Egypt and the United States had rich agriculture. Uh, that included cotton, which was the fuel of the industrial, early industrial revolution, kind of the oil of the time. Uh, of course, it, there was a difference. Uh, uh, unlike Egypt, uh, the United States had to develop cotton production and a workforce by conquest uh, extermination and slavery. Consequences still remain. Uh, one fundamental difference between Egypt and the United States, in fact the determining one, was that the United States had gained independence and uh, Egypt had not. Therefore the United States was free to ignore the prescriptions of uh, economic theory. Uh, they were delivered in the late 19th, 18th century by uh, Adam Smith in to the United States uh, shortly after its independence uh, using terms that are quite familiar. In fact, they're pretty much the same as the ones that are preached to the uh, so-called developing societies by the World Bank and the IMF and economic uh, specialists today. Uh, Smith urged the liberated colonies to keep, what, to keep to what was later called their comparative advantage. Uh, to produce primary products for export and to import the superior British manufacturers and certainly not to attempt to monopolize the crucial goods, particularly cotton, the most important. Uh, any other path, he wrote, would, would retard instead of accelerating the further increase in the value of their annual produce and would obstruct instead of promoting the progress of their country toward real wealth and greatness. If any of you have studied economics, you know that that's the right conclusion. It's the same conclusion that's given to the South, the third world today. Well, having gained their independence, the colonies were free to ignore his advice, to ignore what's called sound economic theory, and to follow England's own course of independent state uh, guided development, which radically rejected sound economic theory uh, in ways that ought to be understood here. For example, uh, England was uh, stealing uh, high technology from the Low Countries and from Ireland and using state force to create a powerful uh, economy. So the U.S. followed the same course. Uh, it set up uh, high tariffs to block uh, British exports first textiles, later steel, uh, carried out, initiated all sorts of other devices to uh, accelerate industrial development. And uh, the now independent republic uh, also attempted to gain a monopoly of cotton, came pretty close. The reasons were stated explicitly. The reasons were to place all other nations at our feet, uh, particularly the British enemy, which was militarily more powerful in those days. Uh, but could be brought to the feet of the United States if the U.S. monopolized the cotton, which is crucial for their uh, early industrial development. Uh, those were the Jacksonian presidents, their announcement when they conquered uh, Texas and half of Mexico. Uh, notice that the U.S. policies in the mid-19th century 
were essentially those that were attributed to Saddam Hussein. There were wild claims that he was trying to control the energy resources of the Middle East and you know, bring the rest of the world to his feet. Well, that was a fantasy, but it wasn't a fantasy when the U.S. carried out those policies in the mid-19th century. That's one of the ways it became the most powerful, richest country in history. Well, for Egypt, uh, there wasn't any comparable course because it was barred by British power. Uh, Lord Palmerston declared that uh, no ideas of fairness toward Egypt ought to stand in the way of such great and paramount interests of Britain as preserving its uh, economic and political uh, hegemony. Uh, he expressed uh, what he called his hate for the ignorant barbarian uh, Muhammad Ali, kind of developmental leader of Egypt who dared to seek an independent course. He deployed Britain's fleet, uh, major military force of the 19th century, uh, and British financial power, which is also overwhelming, uh, to terminate uh, Egypt, Egypt's quest for independence and economic development. Uh, and so it continued. Uh, after World War II, when the United States displaced Britain as global hegemon, uh, Washington adopted the same stand. Uh, Washington made it clear to the Egyptians that it would provide no aid unless Egypt adhered to the standard rules, the rules for the weak, that is. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. continued to violate them, uh, for example, by imposing high tariffs on Egyptian, uh, to bar Egyptian cotton. Uh, that's the usual interpretation of market principles. They're fine for the weak, but not for the strong uh, at home as well. Uh, that's why uh, maybe a quarter of the U.S. population is now qualifying for food stamps uh, while the bankers are providing themselves with enormous bonuses. Those are market principles. Uh, in Adam Smith's defense, uh, I should say that he recognized what would happen if Britain uh, followed the rules of sound economics. And now it's called neoliberalism. It's not very different. Uh, he warned that uh, if British manufacturers, mer merchants, and investors turned abroad, they might profit, but England would suffer. Uh, but he felt that that wouldn't happen because they would be guided by what's called a home bias. So as if by an invisible hand, England would be spared the ravages of uh, economic rationality. Actually, that passage in Wealth of Nations is pretty hard to miss. It's the only time that the phrase invisible hand appears in the book, namely in uh, uh, an argument against what we now call neoliberalism. Uh, that's the one occurrence of the famous phrase. Uh, the other uh, leading founder of classical economics, uh, David Ricardo, he drew similar uh, conclusions. He hoped that the home bias, quote him now, would lead men of property to be satisfied with the low rate of profits in their own country uh, rather than to seek a more advantageous employment for their wealth in foreign nations. The feelings, he said, that uh, I would sor be sorry to see weakened. Uh, put aside their predictions, but the uh, instincts of the classical economists were uh, sound and significant and uh, c uh, conform to economic history. The, uh, the democracy uprising in the Arab world is sometimes compared to Eastern Europe in 1989, but on very dubious grounds. Uh, in 80, 1989, the democracy uprising was tolerated by the Russians, uh, and of course it was supported by Western power in accord with the standard doctrine, doctrine that democracy is okay if it uh, conforms to strategic and economic objectives. So it's fine in Eastern Europe where it's breaking up the global enemy, but not in Central America at the same time where it's being crushed by violence. Uh, to, uh, there's no Gorbachev in the West today. Uh, on the contrary, uh, Western, uh, Western uh, power remains very hostile to democracy in the Arab world for quite good reasons, those I mentioned. 
uh, there are actually more apt comparisons uh, between what's happening today and uh, 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 developments in the past, but uh, I can talk about them later if you like, but there's, I'll put them aside now for reasons of time. Well, coming to the present, uh, grand area doctrines, pretty much in the way they were expressed back in the Second World War, uh, they continue to apply to contemporary crises and confrontations. So take what's called in, in Western policy making circles and in uh, political commentary, uh, it's uh, taken for granted that the major threat to world order today is what's called the Iranian threat. In fact, this is called the year of Iran. Uh, and therefore it has to be the major focus of uh, US foreign policy with Europe trailing along politely as it tends to do. Uh, so we might ask ourselves exactly what is the Iranian threat? In fact, you might look and see how often it's discussed. I mean, it's also always brought up, but exactly what is it? What's the Iranian threat? Well, we actually have an authoritative answer to that question. It was provided by the Pentagon and by uh, US intelligence services. Uh, every year they uh, give an annual report to Congress on global security. Uh, the most recent one, a couple of months ago, they of course had a section on the Iranian threat. And uh, what they say is that uh, the Iranian threat is not military. Quote, I'll quote, Iran's military spending is relatively low compared to the rest of the region. Its military doctrine is strictly defensive, designed to slow an invasion and force an invasion of Iran and to force a diplomatic solution to hostilities. Iran has only a limited capability to project force beyond its borders. Its military spending is a fraction of Saudi Arabia, of course, you know, incomparably less than the United States or its allies. And uh, according to uh, General Petraeus, the head of the US Central Command, uh, the Iranian Air Force could be taken out uh, almost instantly by the Air Force of Qatar. Forget the rest. Uh, so that's the military threat. Uh, with regard to the nuclear option, they say, Pentagon Intelligence, Iran's nuclear program and its willingness to keep open the possibility of developing nuclear weapons is a central part of its deterrent strategy. Okay, those are all quotes. Uh, the clerical regime, brutal clerical regime, it's doubtless a threat to its own people, uh, but it uh, hardly outranks US allies in that regard. That can't be the problem. Uh, the threat flies elsewhere and it's ominous and the reports say yes it's ominous. Uh, one element of the threat is Iran's potential uh, deterrent capacity. That's an illegitimate exercise of sovereignty that might interfere with US freedom of action in the region. Uh, it's glaringly obvious why uh, uh, Iran would seek a deterrent capacity. Uh, just take a look at the uh, disposition of military bases and nuclear forces in the region. And actually that's been recognized uh, seven years ago. Uh, Israel, one of the leading military historians in Israel, Martin von Krefeld, uh, wrote that, it's right after the invasion of Iraq, the world has witnessed how the United States attacked Iraq for, as it turned out, no reason at all. Had the Iranians not tried to build nuclear weapons, they would be crazy, uh, his words. Uh, particularly when they're under constant threat of attack by the US, uh, incidentally in violation of the UN Charter, if anyone cares about minor technicalities, uh, whether they are uh, developing nuclear weapons, actually no one knows, but uh, maybe they are. If so, it would certainly be understandable as long as they're under constant threat. Uh, however, Iran's threat, the reports continue, Pentagon intelligence, uh, they go beyond deterrence. Uh, Iran is also trying to expand its influence in neighboring countries, uh, the Pentagon and the intelligence services report. Uh, that is, they're trying to destabilize the region. Uh, it's an interesting term, actually. 
Those are the technical terms of foreign policy discourse. But notice when the U.S. invades and occupies Iran's neighbors, that's stabilization. Iran's efforts to extend its influence to them is destabilization, and hence plainly illegitimate. Uh, that's routine usage. Now, just to give one striking example, a very prominent foreign policy analyst, James Chase, uh, he was properly using the term stability in the technical sense uh, when he explained, quoting him, that to achieve stability in Chile in 1973, it was necessary to destabilize the country, namely by overthrowing the elected government and installing a vicious dictatorship. That's the right usage. Uh, other concerns about Iran are equally interesting to explore, but perhaps that's uh, enough to reveal uh, the guiding principles uh, and, and their status in imperial culture as, uh, to again go back to grand area planning, uh, President Roosevelt's planners uh, emphasized at the dawn of the contemporary world system that the U.S. cannot tolerate any exercise of sovereignty uh, that interferes with its global designs. That's what it means to own the world and to rule it. Uh, the United States and Europe are united in punishing Iran for its threat to stability, but it's useful to recall how isolated they are. Uh, they're referred to as the international community, but remember that has a technical meaning too. The international community means the United States by definition, and anyone who happens to agree with it at the moment. That's the international community. Everyone else is kind of like uh, Arabs in their opinion. Uh, so what about the non-people? Well, the unaligned countries, non-aligned countries, that's the majority of the world's population, uh, they have vigorously supported Iran's uh, right to enrich uranium all the way through. Within the region, as I mentioned, uh, Arab public opinion not only supports the right to carry out uranium enrichment, but quite strongly favors Iranian nuclear weapons. Uh, the major regional power, Turkey, uh, voted against the latest uh, U.S.-initiated sanctions motion in the Security Council, along with Brazil, which is the most admired country of the South. Uh, in fact, Europe and the United States are extremely isolated on this. They are the international community by definition, but uh, you know, by other standards, uh, they're very isolated. Uh, the disobedience of Turkey and Brazil uh, led this sharp censure, not for the first time. Uh, Turkey had been bitterly condemned in 2003 uh, when the government uh, followed the will of 95% of the population and refused to participate in the invasion of Iraq. That demonstrated their very weak grasp of democracy in the Western sense. And uh, they were punished by the US for that and charged in a very hostile commentary. Uh, same after their uh, refusal to support the US sanctions proposal in 2010, that Turkey was warned by Obama's top diplomat on European affairs that it must demonstrate its commitment to partnership with the West. A uh, scholar in the Council on Foreign Relations asked, how do we keep the Turks in their lane where they're supposed to be, uh, uh, acting like good Democrats and following orders? Uh, Brazil's uh, president, Lula, uh, he was admonished in a New York Times headline that his effort to, uh, with Turkey to provide a solution to the Iranian uranium, uranium enrichment issue outside the framework of U.S. power is what they called a spot on the Brazilian leader's legacy. Uh, in brief, do what we say or else. But there's an interesting sidelight to all of this which was effectively suppressed. Uh, that is that the Iran, uh, the, the Iran, Turkey, Brazil deal was approved in advance by the Obama administration, uh, presumably on the assumption that it would fail, that would provide an ideological weapon against Iran. Actually, after the censure of Brazil, its foreign office released a letter from President Obama uh, 
in which he had urged Brazil to proceed with it, hoping that it would, expecting that it would fail. Well, when it succeeded, the approval uh, turned to censure, and Washington rammed through a Security Council resolution, which was in fact so weak that uh, China uh, readily signed. And China, incidentally, is now chastised for living up to the UN resolution that it signed, but not living up to Washington's unilateral um, directives, which go well beyond it. It's in the current issue of uh, foreign, policy, foreign Affairs, major foreign policy journal. Well, the US can sort of tolerate Turkish disobedience, though with some dismay, but China's harder to ignore. Uh, the press warns that uh, China's investors and traders are now filling a vacuum in Iran as businesses from uh, many other nations, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, pull out. And in particular, uh, uh, China's expanding its dominant role in uh, Iran's energy industries. Uh, Washington is reacting to this with a touch of desperation. Uh, the State Department warned China that if it wants to be accepted in the international community, which has the definition I mentioned, if it wants to be accepted in the international community, then it must not skirt and evade international responsibilities, which are clear. Follow U.S. orders. I'm sure that elicited uh, some amusement in China's foreign offices. They're unlikely to be impressed. Uh, there's also uh, a good deal of concern about uh, the growing Chinese military threat. A Pentagon study came out recently and it warned that China's military budget is approaching one-fifth of what the Pentagon spent to operate the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's, of course, a fraction of the U.S. military budget. Uh, they warned further that uh, China's expansion of military forces might deny the ability of American warships to operate in international waters off its coast. That's off the coast of China. Uh, nobody yet has uh, declared that the U.S. should permit Chinese warships to operate freely in, say, the Caribbean, but got to understand why. Uh, China's uh, uh, lack of understanding of the rules of international civility it was also illustrated by its objections to plans, U.S. plans, to send uh, an advanced uh, super aircraft carrier, nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the George Washington, to join naval exercises a few miles off uh, China's coast uh, with capacity to attack Beijing with nuclear weapons. Uh, in contrast, the United States, the West generally, understands that such U.S. operations are legitimate. They're intended to develop, to, to um, defend um, stability in the technical sense. In the U.S., again, the liberal magazine New Republic expressed its concern that China sent 10 warships through international waters just off the Japanese island of Okinawa, which is indeed a provocation. Uh, unlike the fact that they didn't mention that uh, Washington has converted Okinawa into a major U.S. military base uh, in defiance of vehement protests by the population, which still continue. That's not a provocation on the standard principle that we own the world. So how could that be a provocation? Well, putting aside the deep-seated imperial doctrine, which is so so deep-seated that people can't even perceive it, uh, even progressives and so on, you just can't see it. But let's put that aside. Uh, there is good reason for uh, China's neighbors to be concerned about its growing military and commercial power. And going back to the Middle East, uh, although Arab opinion uh, strongly supports an Iranian nuclear weapons program, that uh, doesn't mean that we should, we sh certainly shouldn't. And the foreign policy literature is full of uh, proposals as to how to counter the threat. There is an obvious way, which is never discussed. Uh, the, that is to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. 
or at least move in that direction. Uh, that would do a lot to mitigate, maybe end whatever threat there is. Well, that issue does arise outside the West. Uh, it arose again at the uh, non-proliferation uh, treaty uh, review conference uh, last May, this meeting every five years. Uh, Egypt, which is the was the chair of the non-aligned countries, 118 countries, it called for negotiations on a Middle East a nuclear weapons-free zone. Actually, that had already been agreed to by the West at the 1995 review conference, but they never did anything about it. Uh, international support for this was so strong that President Obama had to uh, formally agree. Uh, so it's a fine idea, uh, Washington informed the conference, but this isn't the right time for it. So someday, you know, when the Messiah comes. Uh, furthermore, uh, let's see, I notice my environment. <laughs> uh, uh, furthermore, the, uh, the United States made it clear that Israel must be exempted from the nuclear weapons free zone. So the Obama administration explained that no proposal can call for Israel's nuclear weapons free program to be placed under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Agency, or it can call for release of information about uh, Israeli nuclear uh, facilities and activities. That's out. Otherwise, it's a great idea someday. Uh, well, so much for that method of dealing with the uh, Iranian nuclear threat. Uh, while grand area doctrine still preve prevails, as in these cases, uh, the capacity to implement it has declined. Uh, the peak of U.S. power was right after World War II. At that point, the U.S. literally had half the world's wealth in position of unimaginable security and military power. Well, that naturally declined. Uh, other industrial countries uh, reconstructed from the devastation of the war. Uh, decolonization took its uh, agonizing course. Uh, by the early 1970s, uh, the U.S. share of global wealth had declined to about 25 percent, still enormous, but uh, not 50 percent. Uh, by that time, early 70s, the industrial world had become what's called tripolar uh, economically. Uh, North America, uh, Europe, and uh, East Asia, which at that time was Japan-based. There was also a sharp change in the U.S. economy in the 1970s, Europe as well, but particularly striking in the U.S., uh, towards uh, financialization of the economy and export of production. Uh, uh, there's no time to go into the details, but they're interesting and important. What, what really happened is that a variety of factors converged to create a vicious cycle of radical concentration of wealth in the U.S. that's by now literally in a fraction of 1% of the population. That's what's causing the huge inequality. That means mostly CEOs, uh, managers, hedge fund managers, people like that. Uh, well, uh, concentration of economic power leads almost automatically to concentration of political power. Uh, that yields a capacity to uh, formulate state policies that increase the economic concentration. It means fiscal policies like taxation, uh, rules of corporate governance, uh, deregulation, much else. So you do get a vicious cycle, sharp concentration of power in the economy and the political system and continuing because they reinforce each other. Uh, meanwhile, the costs of electoral campaigns skyrocketed. The next campaign, 2012, is anticipated to cost $2 billion in the United States. Uh, that drives the political parties into the pockets of concentrated capital, which is increasingly financial capital. Uh, the Republicans reflects it. Uh, the Democrats, who are by now what used to be called moderate Republicans, uh, they're not far behind. In fact, elections have become almost a total charade. Uh, take the 2008 election, which Obama won. Uh, as you may know, shortly after the election, uh, 
won a second victory. He won an award from the uh, advertising uh, industry for the best marketing campaign of 2008. <coughs> Uh, executives were euphoric in the business press. Uh, they explained that they'd been marketing candidates like uh, toothpaste uh, ever since Reagan, but this was their greatest achievement. It would change the style and corporate boardrooms and so on. Well, 2012 election is going to be more extreme. So it's not surprising that uh, uh, Obama is now uh, selecting business leaders for his top positions. That's where the money is, uh, hence the political power. Now, the public is quite angry and frustrated, but as long as the Muashar principle prevails, that doesn't matter in our conception of democracy. Well, wealth and power have narrowly concentrated in the past roughly 30 years, but for the general population, uh, real incomes have stagnated, uh, working hours have gone sky high, uh, support systems have declined. Uh, people have been getting by, more or less, but it's with increased work hours, far beyond Europe by now, uh, with debt and with uh, asset inflation, uh, which is regularly destroyed by the financial crises that began as soon as the regulatory apparatus uh, left by the New Deal was dismantled. Uh, there weren't any financial crises in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, there were several during the Reagan years. They've been getting worse ever since. Uh, most recently, uh, the huge crash uh, that we're still in the middle of, basically. Well, none of this is problematic for the very wealthy because they benefit from a government insurance policy. It's called too big to fail, uh, that, which is an insurance policy. What it means is that the banks and the investment firms, you know, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, their equivalents in, the, in Europe, uh, they can make very risky transactions. Uh, risky transactions yield rich rewards. And when the system crashes, as it's inevitably going to do, uh, they can run to the nanny state for a taxpayer bailout, you know, clutching their copies of uh, Hayek and Milton Friedman and so on. Now, that's been a regular process uh, since the Reagan years, each crisis more extreme than the last, for the population, that is. Uh, so right now, uh, in the United States, unemployment is literally at the level of the Great Depression for much of the population. Uh, meanwhile, Goldman Sachs, one of the main architects of the current crisis, is richer than ever. It just quietly announced uh, Seventeen and a half billion dollars in compensation for last year. CEO Lloyd Blankfein gets a twelve and a half million dollar bonus, and his base salary more than tripled. Uh, it's just in uh, England for the last couple of days, and front page of the newspaper every morning is uh, the same story: Barclays Bank and the rest of them. Yeah, that's great. That's what happens when a government insurance policy. Well. Obviously, it wouldn't do to focus attention on things like this. So propaganda has to find ways to blame others. Uh, in the past few months in the United States, it's uh, been to blame public sector workers, their fat salaries, uh, you know, exorbitant pensions, uh, and so on, all total fantasy. Uh, but uh, it kind of more or less works if you repeat it often enough. So, so the idea is we all must tighten our belts whether it's the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, Europe, everyone else, uh, almost all that is, like not the managers of Goldman Sachs or Barclay Banks, they have to loosen their belts. Uh, well, teachers are a pr particularly good target in the United States. That's part of a very deliberate effort to destroy the public education system. It's happening here too, from kindergarten through the universities. Uh, by eventual privatization. Again, that's good for the wealthy. It's a disaster for the population. It's also a disaster even for the long-term health of the economy. But that's what the economists call an externality, it's something that you put aside when you're making business decisions. It doesn't affect your short-term profit. So it's an externality. You can put it aside uh, insofar as market principles prevail. Another fine target, uh, always, 
as immigrants. Uh, that's been true throughout U.S. history, even more so at times of economic crisis. And it's uh, exacerbated now by a sense in the United States, which has its counterparts here, uh, that the country is being taken away from us. In the United States, the white population is soon going to become a minority. Uh, that's what the uh, House uh, a Republican leader, John Boehner, means when he says it's not the country that I was, I grew up in. They're taking it away from us. Uh, well, uh, who are the immigrants who are targeted? Uh, I happen to live in eastern Massachusetts. Uh, many of the immigrants there are uh, Mayans who are fleeing uh, genocide in the Guatemalan highlands uh, that was carried out by uh, Ronald Reagan and his favorite killers. The devastation still exists, people are fleeing. Uh, other immigrants are uh, Mexican victims of uh, Clinton's uh, NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, that was one of those rare government agreements that succeeded in harming the populations of all three countries involved. Uh, not the rich, they did fine. Carlos Slim of Mexico is now the richest man in the world. He just added another $20 billion to his wealth last year. Uh, partly an after effect, but not the populations. Uh, this was understood. Uh, 1994 was the year that NAFTA was rammed through Congress over popular objection. And it's the same year that Clinton initiated militarization of the border of Mexico and the United States. It had been a pretty open border. You know, pretty much the same people on both sides, the people visiting their relatives and so on. Uh, the border was militarized in 1994. And the reason was understood. It was understood that Mexican campesinos are not going to be able to compete with uh, highly subsidized uh, U.S. Uh, agribusiness and that Mexican businesses are not going to be able to compete with uh, uh, U.S. Uh, multinationals. They have to be granted what's called national treatment uh, in Mexico. So they have to be treated like Mexican companies. That's quite unlike uh, uh, Mexican creatures of flesh and blood. Uh, they don't get national treatment in the United States, needless to say. Uh, these are corporate persons, so-called, who get those privileges. Well, not surprisingly, those measures led to a, have been leading to a flood of refugees and to rising anti-immigrant hysteria by the victims of uh, state corporate policies at home. And much the same appears to be happening in Europe. I've always felt, and I think it's now becoming clear, that racism is more rampant in Europe than it is in the United States. In many ways, it wasn't so evident because the societies kind of looked homogeneous. I mean, if everyone's blonde and blue-eyed, you can say, yeah, I'm not a racist. Uh, but when you get a couple of percent of people who aren't, uh, all of a sudden it comes out. Uh, so right now, for example, one can only uh, watch and wonder as, say, Italy complains about the flow of refugees from Libya. Uh, Libya, in fact, uh, eastern Libya, the now liberated east, uh, that was the scene of the first major post-World War I genocide literal genocide carried out by Italy's fascist government. Uh, now they're complaining about refugees from Libya. Or when France, for example, which is now the main protector of the brutal dictatorships in its former colonies, uh, France manages to overlook its uh, hideous atrocities in Africa. Well, Sarkozy warns of, uh, warns of what he calls the flood of immigrants. And uh, Marine Le Pen, kind of neo-fascist party, which happens to be the majority party in France now, uh, she objects that he's doing nothing to prevent this flood of immigrants. Well, I don't have to mention Belgium, which probably wins the prize for what Adam Smith called uh, the savage injustice of the Europeans. Uh, the rise of neo-fascist parties in much of Europe it would be a frightening phenomenon, even if we were not to recall what happened on the continent in the very recent past. So just imagine the reaction today, say, if Jews were being expelled from France to misery and oppression, and then take a look at the non-reaction when that's happening in France to Roma, 
uh, who were victims of the Holocaust and uh, Europe's most brutalized population. Uh, in Hungary, the neo-fascist party uh, Jabbik gained 17% of the vote in national elections, now the dominant party, which is maybe unsurprising when uh, three quarters of the population feel that they're worse off than under communist rule. Now, you might be relieved when in Austria, the uh, ultra-right uh, uh, Haider party it won only 10% of the vote in 2008. You might be relieved if it were not for the fact that he was, that they were outflanked from the right, far right, by the new Freedom Party, which won almost, over, uh, almost 20%, that's 30% for essentially neo-fascist parties. It's pretty chilling to recall that in 1928, uh, the Nazis won less than 3% of the vote in Germany. We know what happened a few years later. Uh, in England, the British National Party and the English Defense League uh, on the ultra-racist right are becoming major forces. Uh, what's happening in Holland, uh, you know all too well, better than I, I won't talk about it. Uh, in Germany, uh, uh, Thilo Sarrazin's lament that immigrants are destroying Germany was a runaway bestseller. Uh, he was dismissed and the Chancellor, Chancellor Merkel, uh, condemned the book, but she declared that uh, multiculturalism had utterly failed, meaning that the Turks who were brought in to do the dirty work in Germany are failing to become blonde and blue-eyed, <laughs> true Aryans, you know, something wrong with them. Uh, Instantly, those who have a slight sense of irony they might be interested in recalling that Benjamin Franklin, who was you know, one of the leading figures of the Enlightenment, uh, he warned the newly liberated colonies that uh, uh, they should exclude Germans because Germans are too swarthy. Uh, Swedes as well, incidentally, also too swarthy. They're not pure Anglo-Saxons like us. Uh, well, well into the 20th century, uh, ludicrous myths of uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, purity were very common uh, in the United States. That includes presidents, you know, people like the uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, all the way up to Theodore Roosevelt and others, other leading figures, leading writers and so on. Uh, racism in the literary culture has been a, just an obscenity and of course it's far worse in practice. It's going to be a lot easier to eradicate polio than this horrifying plague, which regularly becomes more virulent in, at times of economic crisis. So we can expect it to grow because the crises are going to, very likely going to get worse. Uh, European economic policy is almost driving the continent into permanent crisis. Uh, well, I've barely skimmed the surface of these issues, but I don't want to end without a couple of words on another externality that's dismissed in market systems for institutional regions, uh, the fate of the species. Uh, in the financial system, what's called systemic risk, the probability that uh, your, if a transaction that you make which is good for you may crash the system, which happens all the time. Well, systemic risk can be remedied, namely by the taxpayer, calling the taxpayer to bail out the rich. Uh, but nobody's going to come to the rescue if the environment is destroyed. And that it must be destroyed is virtually an institutional imperative. It's important to keep that in mind. Uh, the business leaders, and business leaders are carrying out major propaganda campaigns, which they announce, to convince the population that uh, anthropogenic global warming, you know, global warming caused by human activity is a liberal hoax. Now those same uh, business leaders understand very well how grave the threat is to what they own, for the grandchildren and so on, but that doesn't matter. In their institutional role as business leaders, they must maximize short-term profit and market share. And not because they're bad people, but because that's an institutional necessity. If they don't do it, they're out. Somebody else is in who does do it. Now that's a, another vicious cycle. And this one could turn out to be really lethal. Uh, 
uh, for the species. Uh, just to take a look at how grave the danger is today, uh, just take a look at the uh, new Congress in the United States, most, most powerful and important country in the world. It was propelled to power by uh, business funding, propaganda, anti-immigrant hysteria, nativist uh, extremism, and so on. But it's there. Uh, almost all of them are climate deniers. In fact, they've already begun to cut funding uh, for measures that might mitigate environmental catastrophe. Uh, cut it very sharply. Uh, worse than that, some of them are really true believers. So, for example, the new head of a uh, subcommittee on the environment explained that global warming can't be a problem because God promised Noah that there wouldn't be another flood. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, if things like, and he speaks for a lot of the country. I mean, if this were happening in, you know, some small and remote country somewhere, you know, you might, might laugh. Uh, but you can't laugh in this case. It's the richest and most powerful country in the world. And what happens there is going to determine what happens globally. And this is what's happening. And before we laugh, we might also bear in mind that the current economic crisis is traceable in no small measure to another fanatic religious faith, uh, the faith uh, in such dogmas as the efficient market hypothesis, core dogma of economic theory, and in general to what uh, Nobel laureate uh, Joseph Stiglitz 15 years ago, long before the crisis, called the religion that markets know best, uh, no basis for it in empirical fact, uh, artifact of economic religion and so on. But given the dogma that markets are necessarily efficient, it was possible for the central bank, uh, Federal Reserve, and for virtually the entire economics profession, it was possible for them not to notice that there was an $8 trillion housing bubble that had no basis whatsoever in economic fundamentals and broke from a 100-year record of housing prices pretty much conforming to, um, uh, in, to, value, to general value in the economy. But you couldn't see it because, because you have a religious doctrine. Uh, the markets are efficient, so that'll take care of, care of it. And uh, that, of course, devastated the economy and brought down a lot of Europe when, the, uh, when it burst. <coughs> Europe had similar phenomena. Well, all of this and uh, a lot more can proceed as long as the Muasher doctrine prevails, as long as the general population is passive, uh, apathetic, uh, diverted um, to consumerism or hatred of the vulnerable, uh, then the powerful can do as they please. And those who survive can uh, contemplate the outcome. Thanks.